<laughs> I know it's a stretch of the imagination. <laughs> but you do have imagination. <laughs> My name is Kimani Nehusi and I'm faculty at Temple University in the Department of Africology. I want to begin with an apology. You're going to see this coming up later because we haven't been able to get the glyphs properly translated on the screen um, in, the, in the files. So some of the glyphs are going to come up as nonsense. I hope it wouldn't detract from this presentation. What I propose to do is talk about land and identity in the African tradition from ancient to modern times. And what I want to stress here is that African people are connected in space and time. Our ancestors knew that all of us belong to the same community of Africans. Africans past, Africans present, and Africans in the future. And that even past, present, and future are not very accurate ways of announcing our reality. Because we do not make those rigorous uh, definitions or divisions. And I think I'll join with Tristan here in saying that we don't do time past, time present, and time future. We do aspects. What is it we're doing? You know, is our action complete? Is our action ongoing? Is up something um, habitual? And we must be habitually African. And therefore, our attempts to understand ourselves must in, um, begin at our beginning. We must connect ourselves to ourselves wherever we exist in space and time. And a big part of this has to do with the reclamation of Kemet, our understanding of ancient Egypt as one of the earliest African places with which or for which we have a relative abundance of information. And the way in which that illuminates Africa after is very, very important. So again, we establish the need, and for that matter, demonstrate the relevance too of specialists in ancient Egyptian studies, including the language. So let's see the significance of land in Africa as the basis of the human infrastructure, the humanization of humanity took place on land. And this tremendous significance of land in African tradition has to do with its basis as the spiritual infrastructure, the economic infrastructure, the social infrastructure, the political infrastructure, all that we do is based um, physically and spiritually on the land. And as we're saying this, let us recognize that a big part of our difficulty wherever we exist today arises from the fact that other people, mainly Arabs and Europeans, have colonized our lands, have put us off our lands, in very many instances the best land, and also have disrupted our relationship to our land and the way in which we perform our rituals. So again, the reclamation of ourselves has to do with the reclamation of land and the retaking of our rituals. I think it's instructive to understand ourselves by beginning, as, as I said before, as near as possible to the beginning as we could get. And Kemet is one of those places. One of the things we notice is that ancient Egyptians, the people of Kemet, always wanted to be buried in their own land, the land that they grew up in, the part of Egypt that they grew up in. And if you look at the earliest seafarers, people who were leaving Egypt, to go to what's now um, Syria and places that are wrong about. The they always wanted, if they died abroad, for their bodies to be taken back to Egypt, to be buried in their villages. 
We see this in the tale of Sinue also. Sinue was a guy who fled Kemet and went to live in what we might call Syria today. He was very successful. But as he grew older, he became very worried. He didn't wish to die and be buried elsewhere. So he returned to Kemet. He left all the riches, all his successes, and he went back to Kemet. This is important. The early autobiographical texts also demonstrate this preoccupation with the land. People are saying, I come from such and such a place. This is one of the first things they tell you about themselves. So they identify themselves by their relationship to their land in their village. Now, ancient Egyptians had a certain spiritual relationship to inner Africa and a certain geographical orientation which Geoc commented upon. Now, what I had here is a series of ancient Egyptian words that, that didn't come out as ancient <laughs> Egyptian. So I do apologize for that. Um, and I'm just going to tell you that ancient Egyptians referred to inner Africa as Taniter, meaning God's land, land of the gods. They referred to the people who inhabited inner Africa as Taneshi. Now, Arab and European translators would try to say that these were not really the same people as the ancient Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians made it very clear that these were the very same people. The difference was nationality, not racial identity and cultural identity. The ancient Egyptian... <laughs> I like this Egyptian. <laughs> I think I'm going to use it from now on. The ancient Egyptians referred to inner Africa as Tayaku, land of the ancestral or our ancestral spirits. Now this is important because what they're saying is this is the place in which the spirits of our ancestors dwell. Why did the spirits of the ancestors dwell there? Because dead bodies were buried there. But there is something else. It's also because naval strings were buried there. Now this is important because it's a point that many of us here would recognize instantly. Because most African people treat the navel string and the or the placenta with reverence, ritually buried. And across the Caribbean and many parts of Africa today also, people bury the navel string as a marker of attachment to the land. The ancient Egyptians had the same attitude. So, ancient Egypt, Egyptians also had a certain way of orienting themselves by way of reference to the land in inner Africa. Their idea of south was related to the word for front, a cognate of front. For them, 15 minutes later, okay. <laughs> in the Old Kingdom, up meant south. Now, this is important. Because up meant south for them, so that they were actually looking south from ancient Egypt. That's how they oriented themselves. Um, north was up, west was to the right, and so on. Dong is to, to the north, sorry. Now, the relationship of people and the land was a symbiotic one. Oh, before I even go here, let me just say something that many of us may remember. That a certain king in ancient Egypt, Pepi, was excited when he heard that a small person, a short man, was going to be taken to him from inner Africa. And Eurocentric texts have all kinds of mistranslations. This was actually a man of the Baka people. And Pepi was excited because he said, that this guy would have the dances of the ancestors, meaning the authentic dances. He is coming from the heartland, the cultural, psychological heartland. 
So he, he's an important person for that reason. Now, throughout Africa, beginning with ancient Egypt, there are a profusion of earth divinities because African people recognize the importance of the earth. We can't go into this. Also, totems, taboos, and names. I'm using some Eurocentric um, terminology here. These are ways of connecting people to the land. African people always did not eat in each community certain things. And the result of that is that a system of species preservation and therefore species protection spread itself across the land without a single gun or offense. Because in somebody's village, they don't eat the goat. The goat is a protected species. In the next village, they didn't eat the snake. It's protected and so on and so forth. And in all of those villages, there were sacred groves. You don't cut down any tree in a sacred grove. So we had environmentalism before the environmentalists. And we've got to understand ourselves in these ways. And people like Rodney, Fano, and Cabral commented on African identity as a way of relating to the earth. Now, this slide reminds me that the people in ancient Egypt also referred to inner Africa as placenta land, Takenset. And then there are a number of authorities that show that African people had the specific approach to the land that made it impossible for anybody to own the land in the European sense. It didn't belong to any one person or to any one family. The person we refer to as the king or the chief was the manager of the land. Nobody had a right to uncontested ownership. Land was parceled out according to need and to tradition. Now, in different parts of the Caribbean, immediately after the legal termination of physical enslavement, African people started to re-Africanize themselves. And one of the ways in which this is shown is in Guyana, where they started to do this very same thing, owned land um, communally and distributed in that way. We don't have enough time to go more deeply into this, but I will end with this photograph. It's of a church building in the village in which I grew up. And it is shaped, it was built by African people who had just been released from physical enslavement, and it shows that they were conducting intellectual resistance. This church is built in the shape of a ship that brought our ancestors from Africa. And therefore, our ancestors in that village left us with certain questions that are urgent in every generation of us. Do you know from whence you come? Do you know how you got here? Do you know? Do you really, really know? Thank you. <laughs>